Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters. Welcome back to another episode of America Adapts. It's the second annual America Adapts holiday special. I am hosting three amazing expert guests during this show, where we will have a robust discussion talking about the top climate news stories of 2017. We then talk about some of our favorite moments and guests on the podcast this year. It has been a great year with guests ranging from climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe, activist Bill McKibben, to climate skeptic Mark Morano. We also spent a bit of time discussing the future of America DAPs. Okay, my guests in this episode are Jade Lovell, Director of Reagency Science Marketing and the host of SciQ on the Young Turks Network. Also, Sean Martin, Director of Adaptation and Resilience at the World Wildlife Fund. And finally, Science Communication Specialist, Dr. Tim Watkins, who I'm sure some of you might remember from last year's holiday special. Okay, more on the status of America DAPS. It's been a year where I've started to travel a bit with the podcast. I was sponsored by the World Wildlife Fund to record at a conference in Kampala, Uganda. I also went and met with students and recorded at Harvard University in the spring. And I recently returned from California where I interviewed landscape architects at their annual conference. It's been a very exciting year and we dig into some of these moments during the episode. So if this is your first episode of America DAPS, it's a bit unusual. We're letting our hair down a bit and have some fun talking about these issues. We're even drinking some avocado wine, and yes, that's the sound of wine being poured in case you're wondering what it is. So since this is a bit of an unusual episode, I encourage you to look back at the podcast archive and find some other episodes to get a better sense of a typical show. There are a bunch, so have at it. So I have mentioned every episode I love hearing from listeners. I had the pleasure this past week to meet a listener visiting DC all the way from Australia. She's actually American, but studying in Oz. Bernadette, if you're listening to this episode, it was a real treat chatting with you and keep up the important work that you are doing. And thank you for the gift card. That was so sweet. I randomly get to meet listeners and it's awesome. I love hearing what their favorite guests are. And I think it's funny when people say things like, oh, I thought you'd be taller. Darn it. I'm six feet and that's tall enough. Okay, before we get started, just some housekeeping. First off, America Daps is now on Spotify and available for its 100 million users. Yay! Spotify is ramping up their podcasting presence, and you can download all their episodes. Apparently, Spotify is very popular with millennials, so I'm hoping to make more inroads with that crowd. If you go on Spotify on their mobile app and search Climate Change, America Daps shows up as the first podcast available. How cool is that? You can also just search for America Daps. If you're Android listeners, hopefully this will be a useful resource for you. Okay, adapters, it's the end of the year, and all of you are now desperately looking for organizations to donate to. December is traditionally the biggest month for giving, so please consider supporting America Adapts. We have come a long way, and we've done it through the support of listeners. Please consider giving a tax-deductible donation. And tell your friends if they're looking for a good grip to give to. You can find links to Flip Cause donate page in the show notes. And to those who are already donating and recurring donators, thank you. Also, if you are interested in sponsoring a specific podcast or having me speak at a public or corporate event, please contact me via the website americadaps.org. Okay, upcoming guests. I've said this several times. It's just the way the window works for this calendar. But I have an economist from Zillow, right, the real estate firm, coming on to talk about some sea level rise work they're doing. I also have Professor Elizabeth Rush from Brown University talking about nonfiction writing and climate change. And I'm hard at work, and I've said this before on an episode by the World Wildlife Fund focusing on snow leopards in Central Asia and adaptation. Yes, this one is coming out soon. Trust me. Okay, I know how this works. You want me to start this thing. Okay, it's beginning to look a lot like the America Daps Holiday Special. Welcome back, Adapters. We have a very special episode right now. It is the holiday special that we're we're going to have, and... I have a great group of people here joining me for the holiday special. And people remember last year we had our first holiday special with Dan Ackerstein and Tim Watkins. And back this year, and I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves, and I'm going to start here. We have two groups. Three of us are here in Washington, D.C., and one person's up in New York City at YouTube Studios. And I'm going to go to my right here. All right, let's introduce ourselves. Hey, Doug, this is Tim Watkins, science educator guy extraordinaire and um a regular on the Adaptation Wine Power Hour, although we've had a hiatus for <laughs> several months, so we glad to be back. And I'm Sean Martin. 
I am the Senior Director of Climate Change Adaptation and Resilience at World Wildlife Fund, and I'd like to welcome both of you and Jade audibly, audibly to the Panda Hi. Palace, where we were hosting today's podcast. And thank you. Um, the one sad part about being the outlier in New York City is that I get to show you a holiday wine. Well, on that note, please, Jade, introduce yourself. I'm Jade Lovell. I am the host of SciQ on PYT Network and the CEO of Reagency Science Marketing. All right, great. And so everyone out there, if what these people have in common is they are on the advisory committee for America Adapts Media. And so as most of you know, America Adapts is now a nonprofit organization. And so I created this advisory committee, and we have uh, several others on it. Jesse Keenan from Harvard, Dan Ackerstein, lead consulting, and then <gasps> Molly Cross from the Wildlife Conservation Society. They couldn't join us, but I thought we'd get this team together, and we're going to talk about several things today, and I think this will be kind of fun for folks. And so we're going to kick it off by talking about the top climate stories of 2017. And you know what? I'm going to step back for a sec. As Tim mentioned earlier, we haven't done the adaptation wine power hour in probably nine months. And so <laughs> so long we don't even remember the name of it. And I'm going to just defer <laughs> to Tim. Either. And we've got here, we'll make some, as you can tell, we've got some wine glasses here. That's right. And, and we'll, we'll decant here. Now, I need to give a little bit of background and context, especially since we probably have several new listeners. And um, <laughs> move the audio equipment away from the wine bottle. They don't want to get away. So at the very start of this podcast, over a year ago, Doug and I started the Adaptation in Wine Power Hour, and the reason it was called that is we decided we would do a little chit-chat at the end of an episode, and we happened to be drinking wine, although we were not in the same room, and we started talking about wine. And as we were talking about it, I got on a topic that I had been thinking about at that time, which is what will climate change do to wine um, you know, wine growing, wine producing regions, people's identity of wine with certain places. Are we all going to start drinking Norwegian wine? Uh, and I remembered years ago that I was in South Florida and I had a wine that was not made from grapes, um, but was made, can you believe it, from avocados. And I said, we should drink avocado wine. So a year later, I finally remembered all this and I ordered some and this is what we've got. So this is an avocado wine from South Florida. We're not doing product placement, so I don't think I should mention the name of the label. Um, but this is not your typical wine, and this may be what we're going to be drinking in the future with climate change. So cheers. 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 For our cheers. listeners. And we're sorry, Jade. And, you're not you here guys, to cheers. We'll have you guys never had this before? It will be my first sip for bad. our listeners. It's not red. It's more like it, a white. That's right. Slightly green. Excellent. Well, it's really green. It's you've got a point of no, green. It's like a, <laughs> oh, a white with a green tinge, and it's sweeter than I thought. Oh, okay, um, it's get a not bad. I could use a nice hors d'oeuvre. I'm a little hungry, but this is delightful. All right, wine so, well with some guacamole and chips. Right, all right. Doug's going to hold up his wine, and we're getting a picture of this so that we can put it on the website. Right, That's exactly. Fine. Okay, all right. All right, moving on. Thank you, Tim, for bringing the <laughs> wine, and we've got the wine started. All right, so let's get moving on. What we're going to talk about today are the top climate stories of 2017, and we did this last year, and we're going to go around, and everyone's going to list their top three, counting down from three to one, and we'll weigh in as much as we can. And if you don't have three, if you just have one, that's fine. And then after that, we're going to talk about some of – your favorite episodes over the past year. And I know you guys have your favorite episodes and we're going to chat about that and we're going to describe why it's your favorite. You know, what are the things that were brought up and I, they're all my favorites, but um, I, I'm going to weigh in with what your favorites are. And then we're going to talk about what's next for America Daps, the podcast. Some exciting things are planned for 2018 and I wanted to bring my advisory committee together and we're actually doing a bit of a brainstorm and wanted to share it with you, the listeners, because this is, been going on for about 18 months and doing a lot more than I ever thought I would. And so what's next for the podcast? And we're going to have that conversation. And then finally, we're going to go around. Well, you guys all know what's coming up at the end. I don't even need to say it. So I'm going to have a little guest host toward the middle of this, but um, I'm going to kick it off. And I want to start off since we started off here in um, DC with Jade your top – well, how should we do this? I didn't plan this in advance. Just should we go through – Each do our number three, and then we'll each go on to our number two. Is that okay? Does that sound right, Jade? Um, no, all right. So starting with you, Jade, number three. 
Well, my number three was the March for Science. And I know it wasn't strictly a climate moment, but there was a lot of focus around the March for Science on climate change and the EPA and general environmental awareness. So I uh, really loved the moment of seeing all of these scientists getting together. And I loved how much of a focus climate change was. Um, I like the science. They, you know, and all of this sadness that's happening around science and uh, climate change. There were some really hilarious signs that got featured in the media. My favorite was "Keep your tiny hands off my science." Um, but it was it was nice to see that when people were thinking about the science issues that mattered most to them, they identified climate change and the need to adapt, and that was portrayed in all of the signs and sentiment as well. So that was my number three. Okay, I'm going to jump in, and I don't need to dwell. That was my number three. I just thought it was a pretty massive moment, and it was in right after the the, the women's march, and so it was pretty exciting. A lot of a lot of positive energy. I think a lot of bad news came after that, but it was a really big deal. All these people came together for a march. So, yep, yeah, that was my number three. Interesting. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I did not think about those marches, but that's that's great. Um, so my number three on the surface is not an adaptation story at all, but if you scratch just below the surface, I think you'll see that it is an adaptation, climate adaptation story, and that is um, the plight of the Rohingya in um, South Asia migrating from Burma into Bangladesh. Um, in the news quite a bit, most people probably think of this as international you know, humanitarian crisis with um, ethnic cleansing overtones, and it is. But um, this is exactly the sort of mass movement of people that climate change is going to force, and it happens to be going on in one of the lowest, um, altitudinally lowest, elevationally lowest places in the world. Bangladesh, I think, is the lowest, flattest, most crowded um, part of the world, and we can expect large numbers of people, I think, in the not so distant future moving in that part of the world. And we got a taste of what the political, um, humanitarian, economic consequences of that are. So it's a real downer story. And I'm sorry to lead off with a downer uh, of uh, climate change for my number three, but that's, that's what I'm going with. John. Okay. My turn. So uh, I am going to also add a depressing story. <laughs> so Jade, when it's your turn, you're going to have to lift this back up again. Um, and, and mine, uh, were things that happened in 2016 that are just being reported on in 2017. And, uh, that's what happened in the natural world with horrible climate impacts, mainly due to the huge El Nino event. So we've all heard that, uh, in 2016, large portions of the Great Barrier Reef not only bleached, but died. And uh, whether they were marine protected areas or not didn't seem to have any bearing on whether they survived or not. Uh, and much less known in Australia um, is the Gulf of Carpentaria. It's that big, that big, looks like someone took a scoop out of the top of Australia that wedges right into to New Guinea. And there is a huge, huge area of pristine mangrove, mangrove stands that within a period of a few months just died. Uh, and it did not get much play, but, um, uh, and then of course we have, um, just the ongoing onslaught of forest fires that are happening not only last year, but also this year. And, uh, for me, this was in the conservation world really helped to get people to understand this is happening now. This isn't a 2050 problem and things that we were hoping would, uh, last for a while are, disappearing before our very eyes. Uh, in Australia this year, um, in this year, they're surveying the Great Barrier Reef to see what's coming back, what's left, what's still under stress. So some interesting research coming out of there. And also it was a last year event, but, uh, the news just came out that 2016 was the largest year for forest fires. We lost more land, uh, more forest cover to fires last year than any year in history, and uh, that has significant implications for what we want to do on climate mitigation front. Tim, you want to get out that the rest of the bottle? Yeah, uh, seriously. <laughs> Jeez, I'm being shot. <laughs> oh, all right. Jay, number two, bring us back. 
Well, first of all, Sean, thank you for listing Australia because I'm on Australia. I'm heading back there in just over a week to celebrate Christmas, but it's summer in Australia right now, just like it's winter in the Northern Hemisphere, and we've just had massive flooding in my home city, and it's not, it's usually one of the driest places in, in on Earth, and uh, to have floods at this time of year is just extraordinary. But that's not my number two. Uh, my number two is a piece of good news. So um, as we all know, there was the uh, devastation of the hurricane in Puerto Rico, but there was a really beautiful piece of news that came out in the last week and was republished today, so you can go and check this news out. Um, a Puerto Rican national is working with the AAAS. Um, his name is Luis Almodovar. He's working with the American Association of the Advan- for the Advancement of Science to help promote um, innovation. Um, so an invention as part of the um, AAAS's Invention Ambassadors Program. So encouraging Puerto Ricans and Americans everywhere to address these challenges of climate change um, and extreme weather events with in uh, the spirit of innovation and invention so that they can build, uh, not just rebuild, but build a stronger and more resilient Puerto Rico. So I just love the idea that there's a science organization working with really smart, intelligent people to overcome and and rebuild and build stronger. So thanks, Louise, and also thanks to the AAAS for helping build resiliency against climate change. All right, that was also related to my number two. And uh, I will build on that. So my number two was the big hurricane season of 2017, the most expensive ever, uh, and all kind of superlatives there, the most number four or five bunched into a two-week period or whatever. Uh, But like Jade said, there's a lot of good coming out of the, uh, the hurricanes. The prime minister of Dominica plans to rebuild his island, which was totally... It's not his island, but the island of which he is prime minister, uh, wants to rebuild to serve as a model for other small island states to become the world's first climate resilient island. And so uh, we are looking for ways to support that effort. And it's a great idea. And we need a lot of innovation. Well, my number two is related to the hurricane season, but it's focused more on what happened in Houston. I mean, Houston was really this unique event, this what systems, you know, was over Houston and dumped all this rain. It was almost like an experiment. What if you dumped 30 inches of rain over Houston over a few days? And that's what happened. And then how the city reacted, I thought was very interesting, very newsworthy. And now afterwards, how's the city sort of planning? How's it, the conversations around flood zones, are they going to do the right thing? I don't know yet, but it, there has been some really interesting positive work that has come out of Houston It really was almost like a giant experiment. What if you did this to a major urban area in the U.S.? How would you respond and how would the people respond? And so, yeah, it's still playing out. But I thought that was a fascinating uh, storm event. And, um, yeah, I think the people of Houston have nicely responded so far. We'll see if – and, again, I think another element is it's a very conservative state – you know, Houston isn't necessarily as conservative, but Texas is conservative and how people respond in that respect. And they weren't talking about climate change as much as maybe we wanted them to, but uh, they were still responding to this. So hmm. so my number two is not about a particular um, event or discrete uh, news item, but rather it is um, what surprises me a little bit in 2017 um, is really the emergence of business communities and local governments and subnational groups um, really stepping it up on climate change mitigation and adaptation and leadership. Um, you know, 2017 was just the year of absolute disaster and panic and um, discouragement and depression about Trump pulling out of the um the Paris Agreement and, and, you know, all things bad when it comes to climate change and everything else in the environment. Um, and yet, despite all that, you see whole, you know, businesses and sectors of the economy saying, no, we this is really important to us. It's important to our customer base. It's important to our bottom line. It's important in our, you know, to our, our shareholders. It's important to us as a company and the moral and ethical values that we stand for. And, and we're going to um, we're going to acknowledge that climate change is real and we're going to plan for it and we're going to fund, you know, and, and make business plans for uh, dealing with climate change and all the rest. And I'm really heartened to see 
uh, the leadership, for example, of Jerry Brown, governor of California, which is what, the, the fifth largest economy in the world or something like that, um, <clears throat> say, you know, uh, if you don't launch satellites, we're going to launch our own to study climate change uh, or showing up, um, you know, in the international climate change negotiations because the official leadership of the United States delegation wasn't wasn't going to be there and wasn't taking sufficient action. So um, I, I just feel like there's sort of the sense that despite all the damage that Trump and others are doing, there's, you know, there are a lot of strong threads that are holding everything together um, and allowing for some progress, <clears throat> uh, at least in this country. So, Yeah, I was in Bonn for the climate negotiations, and you, as I think most of us know by now the U.S., which didn't have an official or a much smaller official government presence than we usually do, the U.S. had its own entire subnational mm-hmm. pavilion, which WWF played a large part in coordinating uh, through the We Are Still In movement, and uh, along with uh, Mayor Bloomberg, or former Mayor Bloomberg, and uh, many others. So it was really exciting to see all that, and it really, uh, I don't want to say turned the tide. The tide was turned when we signaled our intention to pull out of the Paris Agreement, but it really helped uh, provide a strong message to the rest of the world that the U.S. is not taking its cues from the federal government, that we're in the Paris commitment with or without Mm -hmm. national leadership. You know, the the conservative and libertarian voices that I see in the media about climate change, often in the form of trolls um, online, uh, you know, will say things like, well, you know, don't don't talk about climate change and the federal government's role unless you're hanging your laundry on your line and you're walking to work and, you know, doing and solar panels on your roof, which I actually happen to do. But um, there's that sort of criticism from the right about, you know, don't rely on government to solve these problems uh, unless you yourself as an individual are taking action. And. To some extent, there's a lot of valuable truth in that. And um, <clears throat> one of the lessons I've gotten from this is don't despair about the fact that Trump wants, wanted to pull us out of the Paris Accord or that he thinks that climate change is a hoax because he's one person. And yes, he has tremendous influence but uh, and, and policies matter. But, um, you know, there's still an enormous role to play for individual action that is added up over 9 billion people. And as Doug and I have a former co-worker who used to say, well, you know, climate change was caused by the individual actions of billions of people over time, and it's going to be solved by the individual actions of billions of people. I, you know, I think that's an important thing to remember and that we all really do have considerable power, um, even in the age of this current administration. All right. Jay, take us home on number one. Well, I want to pick up on that point about libertarians in, uh, when we talk about our favorite episodes. But before we do, the number one, you already stole my point about uh, Trump, be, uh, Trump, Jerry Brown being dubbed the California anti-Trump doll. Switch to a different number one. Um, it was, uh, oh, it, I'm in marketing, so I often represent a lot of commercial firms. And it's, uh, usually suicide or at least bad practice for a commercial firm to publicly uh, contradict the policies of the president or the federal government. But it was very heartening to see the Mars company, the confectionery mm-hmm. company, commit a billion dollars to mm-hmm. climate adaptation this year as part of their sustainable in a generation plan. What a commitment to climate change adaptation and uh, creating a sustainable future. They committed not only the money, but they were going to reduce their carbon footprint by 50% and invest in renewable energies all around the world. So it's exactly what Sean and Tim were saying, that it can be uh, individuals, it can be corporations, it can be sub-national governments that help solve climate change or help us adapt. It doesn't have to be the federal government and that there's a huge role for these corporations to be playing and helping society and pulling their their weight and showing their civic corporate social responsibility. So it was really good form from the Mars company, although I'm sure it was a risky move for them politically. And Jay, do you think we saw a similar thing with Elon Musk and his um, his commitment to 
pro- providing electricity for Puerto Rico through solar panels in the context of this very personal spat between the um, between the president and the the governor of of um, Puerto Rico? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really risky. I mean, Elon Musk has spoken publicly about his role as uh, advising the president on how we should. Uh, incorporate technology and, uh, you know, solve things like climate change. But he also then took those steps. Um, and so on one hand, he had a responsibility to contribute to policy and try and play nice. But on the other hand, uh, when he was pushed, he stuck with his, his policies and did what he thought was the right thing. So sometimes uh, you've got to do your best to get along and, you know, presidents come and go and if corporations don't easily or uh, often take sides in this in these kind of spats. But I should say it wasn't just Elon Musk and it wasn't just Mars. It was also Under Armour, Nike, uh, Adidas, The Gap, Levi's. These are all brands that publicly committed to helping address climate change. And most of them used the opportunity to point out their point of difference with the uh, with the president. So, it, you know, that's a really big deal that these corporations are willing to speak out so publicly when they disagree and can see that there's a need to do the right thing here. Are these companies, you, you mentioned Mars and committing to adaptation. I hadn't heard that, uh, and I heard, uh, certainly hope it's true, but most of the companies are really pledging uh, their commitments on climate change mitigation, reducing their own fossil footprints and not only at their own companies, but throughout their operations and their supply chains. Um, I haven't heard too much about commitments to adaptation. Do you have any info on that to share? I mean, it's a billion dollars. So they've done all sorts of different things with it. They've got, I checked out their website and they've got long-term targets, short-term targets. They're committed to um, like helping reduce environmental impacts, as you say, but they're also investing in technologies to help build resilience. So it wasn't just mitigation, but also adaptation. So uh, I was impressed, you know, a billion dollars, you probably have to spend it on a number of different things. So they've, they've covered all their bases. I'm sure they were well advised on how to spend such a large chunk of change. Um, but yeah, I was impressed when when they're throwing out words like science, innovation, and technology, and building resilience, and improve the lives of people, that, that's, uh, it's nice to see them committing to these things. Whether or not they do a good job remains to be seen, but I like the... All right, Sean, well, why don't you, 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 you go one yeah. up to your number one? Yeah, so mine's kind of related, picking up on that uh, theme. Uh, and it's not a big news story. It's a drip, drip, drip kind of story, but I can see, uh, hopefully a tsunami about to happen with adaptation really coming to the forefront. So, um, one, she mentioned, uh, Jade mentioned Mars and, and, uh, the talk of a billion dollars in funding to support adaptation and mitigation. The Green Climate Fund got up and rolling. And it has $5 billion in its coffers committed to adaptation in developing countries, uh, which is great news. Uh, but in addition to the carrots we're seeing for adaptation, I'm seeing a lot of nice sticks coming along from very powerful institutions. So uh, back in June, there was a report that S&P started to warn banks that ignore climate risk will mm-hmm. face a... Mm-hmm. downgrade in their credit. Mm-hmm. And it's not just, uh, you know, typically companies often thought of uh, climate risk as exposure to investments in fossil fuels that will be, you know, being phased out or having stranded assets, fossil fuel assets. Uh, but this is really uh, like looking at things like agriculture. If, if you're investing in agricultural commodities, you're at risk and you need to be doing something, not just disclosing how you're at risk, but actually taking actions to mitigate that risk. Um, and then just uh, November 29th, there was another uh, similar report uh, on Moody's warning cities to address climate risk or face downgrades. Uh, so there's uh, there's for the financial institutions, uh, there also for cities themselves. If you are not taking action to mitigate climate risk, uh, Moody's will downgrade your credit rating. And then just uh, a few days ago, there was another article uh, on Business Green that talked about uh, companies and and companies 
it's, it reported that uh, almost half of companies expect to have some kind of climate change impact on their value chains within within five years. That language doesn't make quite sense to me. I think they're talking about extreme weather events. Uh, but interestingly, only a quarter are preparing for it. So half are aware of the risk and only half of that half are doing anything about it. So uh, where we used to talk about climate change impacts as a way to stimulate more action on mitigation, I think we've started to see a turn in the tide where climate change impacts are giving us the signal that we need to adapt to them, that we're not going to mitigate our way out of the problem. Awesome. That's my top story. All right, my top story, and this is probably top because it's current, it's going on right now, and that's the fires in Southern California. And the reason it's my top story is that I think it um, focuses public attention um, on climate change and on climate change adaptation in particular, like few other events and news items have this year. And again, Jerry Brown, um, his comments sort of ring in my ears a little bit. He said just a few days ago that um, these massive fires, lots of destruction, um, are the new normal in California. And Californians have got to expect more of this in the future. And he really drew a picture of the future as being very different from the past. And that's certainly what climate adaptation is all about. And he's preparing the California public, I think, for living in that new world and having to live differently uh, in that new world. Um, So, yeah, without any further ado, that's my number one. Jerry Brown keeps coming up. And for a variety of reasons, and my number one story, and I'm, I'm glad we sort of avoided the, the pull out of Paris, you know, I think we've talked about it, but it wasn't like, okay, that's the big story. And so my number one is a flip on that is that on the very same day that Trump pulled out of Paris, which we were all expecting, Jerry Brown stepped up and he made this commitment about what California was going to do on climate change and all these different things with mitigation and meeting carbon emission schedule. He had a plan which was very exciting. And so all those things that you just described with the wildfire, fire, he's preparing the people of California, and many of us outside of California are learning from that. But I thought that was such a remarkable thing that he just took advantage of Trump's boobery on this issue and stepped up and showed some leadership. And you know what? He's not the president. He's he's someone in, at the state level, and hopefully other people other countries and local governments will be inspired by that much more than any sort of decision from the president. So I thought that was a really big deal. Hmm. What was that word, that hoobery? Hoobery. <laughs> it's an American word. This is oh uh, wanker. I mean, it's you know what I'm trying to think of some Aussie terms. Idiocy. Awkward. Uh, well, just ima- when you know who we're talking about, you can just imagine what it means. Yeah, he's riding him like a pack of guanas. Um, uh, all right, so we did it. Those were some we covered a lot of ground. Any final thoughts before we get to the next section? I hope 2018 has a lot better news than 2017. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that it will. Too bad. I just um, don't think it will. Um, but there are some common themes here, right? I mean, really, the subnational. Everybody but Trump in the United States cares and is saying it and taking action. I was going to say Syria signing on was mm-hmm. going to be my number one just because that was the last holdout country. And Syria is basically not a country anymore. They're just right. a cobbled together group of people. And yet they're still stepping up yep. on climate change. Yep. And so there you go. I'm looking forward to 2018 and when we can say our favorite moment was when America signed on again to the Paris Climate Accord. Oh, wouldn't that be great? The day after. Oh, I can't go there. Uh, (laughs) We all know. So, Jade, we're going to transition now. And so I'm going to step back and just enjoy myself and not be so stressed out as host of this thing. And so I'm, I'm handing over the duties for this next couple sections for Jade. Handing over the reins, though, that's a very trusting of you. I'll try and do well. I was um, just, I want to talk about favorite episodes for this 2017 of Park 12 Months. And I have to say, Doug, you've done an incredible job of incorporating all different voices. There was 
um, climate change activists, there was scientists, there was uh, people from all around the world, but you also made a point of including like controversial voices, so people representing Monsanto and the Cato Institute. You wouldn't normally think of those people as uh, having something constructive to say on climate adaptation, but it just goes to show um, we've all got opinions on this issue, we've all got something to add, and it, it can be worthwhile listening to contrary voices so that we can try and build those bridges. And we're all in this together, we all live on the same planet, so you've made a really good effort to get everyone's opinions on the table and give them a fair shake. So, well done to you, Sam. Oh, thank you, Jade. All right, so I guess then we can start with you. Um, you're normally the one asking the questions, Doug, but now I'm going to throw it to you. What was your favorite episode? <laughs> it's not really of fair to ask the host. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and other people might decide not to come back on. Oh, I wasn't his favorite. Um, how did I just I, – I sort of label it as like these were wonderful moments within particular episodes um, So <laughs> that everyone else can say favorites. But, uh, no, I, I'll jump in. And I um, – so let's see. You know, I, I looked through this list of – you know, I, it's, I'm, I bet 54 episodes, and, you know, I had quite a few last in 2016. But – what was a lot of fun, and even doing it, was the Mark Morano episode, and maybe other people will bring it up. This is Mark Morano of Climate Depot. He's a f- famous climate denier. He runs. He worked for Rush Limbaugh, and so Randy Olson, we all, who we all know, ha- connected me with Mark, and I got Mark on. We had a really long conversation, and I had a great kind of brainstorming session with Randy about how to approach this episode because I was a little nervous. People are like, oh, he's got Mark Morano on. I'm just like, people, like, you're giving him a platform to talk. And what was, it worked, you know, at the end of the conversation, even though he was spouting off a lot of garbage, I wanted to see what motivated this guy. And I think we dug into that and it, it was exciting. And then Randy came on afterwards and we just had a good old time sort of dissecting that, um, um, uh, uh, the episode and, yeah, it was just a lot of fun. And on top of that, the feedback from that episode, I mean, overwhelmingly, the most feedback that I've heard. And, you know, I just met with a listener. She's from Aust- She came from Australia, and we just met the last few days. And she's like, keep doing it. I love the Mark Morano episode, you know. And it's just like, okay, you know. People want it, it. And it's not going on CNN and debating for five minutes. And that's his thing. He's a bulldog, and he'll run over you. And you, these scientists go on and Bill Nye, and they just get run over. Our conversation was deeper than that. Even though it wasn't that profound, it was more substance than usual, and I think that reflected. So that was a pretty cool episode for me. Hmm. That was my favorite episode as well. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know if it was your favorite episode, but, yeah, uh, I thought we were going to start with number threes, but since you mentioned Mark Moreno, it was probably my top episode of the year for all the reasons you said. I was also a bit nervous about you having somebody like that on, but you handled it beautifully. And I was, you know, expecting him to be a bulldog on the interview, and he wasn't. He was really letting you pick into his brain to talk about how he communicates issues. And I don't want to say I find myself agreeing with him, but I I, I could see where he was coming from, which was really helpful in helping me understand people who make those kind of arguments. And then the, the, the follow up with Randy Olson was especially useful in dissecting everything he said and the communications techniques he uses. And I just found that just fantastic and, uh, need to go back and listen to it again. I hope, uh, you have more guests on like that and, and it's equally, and they're equally as fruitful, but yep, that was probably my favorite episode of the year maybe that can be part of uh what we're going to see coming up for uh for america adapts you've already had the request more controversial guests so. uh yeah i'm uh, i'm totally you know on that and just an anecdote regarding mark one of the listeners who i who's on contact on facebook and such i think with cash is if that's you out there if i'm remembering this she was scared to listen to it. She was holding off listening to this episode because she thought she might be influenced in a negative way, that she might start believing the skepticism. And so she listened to it. She thought he was great, loved his voice, thought he was a guy you would have a beer with, but thought he was insane, you know? And so that was sort of my goal of that episode. It's just like, yeah, this is how those guys effectively communicate, but they're still just pushing bullshit, you know? So 
Isn't that nice though that someone said, I felt like I could have a beer with someone that I disagreed with. And that is so rare when we're talking about climate change. I mean, it's one of those issues that we it's been well documented that it's a polarizing issue and it's a science issue turned a political issue. So nice to see people listening to your podcast, Doug, and thinking, yeah, I couldn't have a beer with that person. Mm. I don't know, know about beer, together. but definitely <laughs> avocado wine. <laughs> Maybe something stronger, uh, a little whiskey. Or... If I can make a one into drink, small right? critique that I found myself as is listening to that. We don't have time I for that. To... But to... No, sorry, <laughs> um, a lot of his arguments were powerful, uh, again, uh, for the climate mitigation debate. Uh, you know, and he was talking about how he doesn't believe the UNFCCC process is the best way to to figure out this issue. I'm sure there's a lot of people who agree with him. Uh, but... I didn't get the sense if you started grilling him on impacts and adaptation, what he would have an answer for that. And so I would have just liked to see you, not to give him a gotcha moment, but like I think, I think he would agree with adaptation, uh, the, the, the reason, uh, the need to ad- adapt. I knew that was coming. I didn't bring up adaptation at all. And, you know, it's an adaptation podcast, and I should have because it might have thrown him for a loop, and maybe it would have influenced him in his own way. Um, to think about climate change in a different way. So that little buzz was me repowering a phone. Sorry, folks. Uh, well, I, I just want to pick up from that point because you, you were talking about the need to bring up adaptation, but also to find the areas where we agree with each other. So it would have been hard to get uh, Mark Morano to agree with you. But I was listening to the Pat Michaels episode uh, just the other day. And thinking how nice it was for you guys, you know, he's like, from the Cato Institute, he's talking about free market adaptation, and uh, you disagreed on a lot of things, Doug, but I loved how you talked about the National Flood Insurance Program, and that was one area where libertarians and uh, people of your mindset, Doug, uh, both agree <laughs> in the rare areas of agreement between environmentalists and libertarians. So even though we often disagree with uh, with each other, people on these different sides of the climate change debate, I'm doing air quotes, you can't say the debate, um, it's nice when you can find an area of agreement. I think once we find those areas of agreement, maybe we can kind of agree on where to adapt or how to mitigate. So it was nice to see you have that moment. That was my favorite. Yeah, awesome. so, so this is Tim, and um, I don't, I, I can't pick out like a favorite, but um, the whole issue of how to have conversations with people that you disagree with or to find those little moments or little areas of commonality, Jade, I think is absolutely essential in climate change communication. Uh, and because of that, one of my favorites was the Catherine Hayhoe episode. And she is, um, I think she she's a hero of mine. She's an extraordinary um uh, she has an extraordinary ability to cross over those boundaries and seek common values and to always begin conversations with people with very divergent opinions um, by seeking those common value sets. Uh, she, so she's a, um, uh, she's a climate change scientist, atmospheric scientist at Texas Tech University, um, uh, and she's also a fundamentalist Christian. And whenever people introduce her, there's sort of these you know, two parts to her identity. She's a scientist and she's a fundamentalist Christian. Um, and I think she wears that sort of dual identity really well. But the conversation that you had with her, uh, I found very, very, very um, heartening and encouraging. Um, and Jade, when you you mentioned the March for Science as your number one story of the year, or I guess number three story of the year, but an important one, um, and I agree. It's the to to hear Catherine Hayhoe as a scientist, um, really underscoring the important voice of science in climate change, and to do it in a way that invites people into the conversation and makes them feel comfortable with science and um, where it intersects their values is really, 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 really important. And and I'm always happy to hear her do that. And I'm, she was a She's a giant in the field. And so, Doug, that was an amazing catch. I don't know. How did you get her? You were introduced to her by somebody else that you had done a podcast with. And she said yes. I think. Right. So, Sasha Peterson, mm-hmm. if you're out there listening, thanks to Sasha. He does adaptation work out of Colorado, and he just knew her from his time in Texas. And yeah. so he reached out to her. And we had, Catherine and I actually were on a panel together, like, 
eight or nine years ago before she went supernova and I sort of was steering along. <laughs> <laughs> we took very different trajectories. Um, and yeah, she came on and talked climate science. And so I, re- I reminded her of that. And she, I think if I recall, she vaguely remembered it, but in a very polite, probably she didn't agree with me. Oh yeah. I remember you, you with the eyes and hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there you go. Adaptive three episode three that, if you haven't been listening, listen to those unique voices already, go and check them out. It's Catherine Hango, and Mark uh, Marano. Pat Michael, and uh, Mark Marano, and Randy Olson. Let's get the four of them in a room. <laughs> yeah, that could be like, <laughs> um, well, Doug, you should have a party with all of your guests. That would be. Oh, well, the, the big plans for that. Let's just take, let's maybe oh, next year we'll do that. We'll have like a right. big gala like dinner and we'll invite everybody. And I sort of look at the original four, even though you guys have been on, I, I kind of look very fondly on the original four because they were the ones who kind of stepped up in Molly, Bob Glazer, Nikhil, Ivani here at WWF, and then um, Nick Fisichelli was the very first. So mm-hmm. they were like, what? What are you doing, Doug? You're podcasting? What's that? <laughs> What's a podcast? You're, you're vlogging? <laughs> um, it's done over the computer. So are we just doing like one f- favorite episode? I mean, I just sort I, of want to have some I've observations. I've got another one. I'm, 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 trying to, I'm trying to counteract my negative. Um, top three news stories of the year. So, Catherine Hayhoe was a very positive episode. My other, another one that I thought was really positive and just, you know, always enjoy are the, the voices of youth. And you had two teens who were in town here in D.C., visiting the Capitol, uh, lobbying their congressmen. Um, I don't know if they were with Citizens Climate Lobby, CCL, which is a, an advocacy group or not, uh, mm-hmm. but they were here during the time that CCL was here. Uh, and what you just encountered them or something on the lawn of the Capitol and you interviewed them. Mm. Uh, they were bright, they were articulate, they were passionate. These are two teenagers, like 14 and 15 years old or something like that from Oregon. They have their own podcast, uh, which you called out, which I thought was um, very generous. And hopefully they've done the same. I don't know. I don't follow them. But, um, uh, it, you know, um, I think we can all recognize that climate change uh affects young people and all subsequent generations for their entire lives much more so than it affects us even uh and just out of a very 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 powerful moral perspective um their voices are so important and uh i was glad that you had them on nice guys they reached out to me um from Oregon and just they found the podcast where listeners and just they were looking to come on and of course I couldn't you know that was great and so they were coming into town for that lobby and I went there just under the shadow of the U.S. Capitol and interviewed these great kids and my my son bless him you know he can barely take his plates back to the dinner table but uh from the dinner table but uh, these kids are solving the world's problems yeah that was pretty cool any other honorable mentions John and Tim yeah, more than honorable mention. So when I think of my favorite episodes, they're kind of three categories. The people that said everything that I agree with, not very interesting. I think my episode, I agreed with everything I said, not very interesting. But there's those that I really learned something from, like Mark Morano. And then there are those that people I just want to debate when I listen to them. And there's a few of those. But two that I really learned from... Uh, one was uh, Ben Preston from Rain Corporation. Mm-hmm. And the reason why that resonated with me, really articulate, really smart guy. Um, uh, he talked a lot about Pittsburgh, which is my hometown, so that piqued my interest. But he talked about climate risk management uh, and really explained it in ways that helped me understand this concept that more and more I have to deal with in my own work. We talk about adaptation, we talk about resilience, we talk about climate risk, climate risk management. They're kind of all sometimes conflated, different different groups use them in different ways. I found Ben's podcast, the episode that he did, just really useful for my own professional work around that particular topic in, partic- uh, in particular. <laughs> Uh, and then the other one was the ground truthing sea level rise models with Karen Bolter. I thought it was a great story to listen to her. And it's something that I face in my work all the time. We often use models and people say, well, how do we know they're right? And, and, and Karen was looking at flood maps that were, you know, uh, based on models. And every time it rained or there was a, 
King High Tide, you'd get in her car with her map and drive around and see if the maps were right. And I just thought that was an incredible story and kind of a, a, a bit inspiring. We all need to do a bit more than that, not just rely on the models, but actually ground truth them so that we know we can use them with any kind of certainty. So really like those. Karen was great. I've been in touch with her, and she's just really prominent in the Miami scene. She's a go-to voice for the media, and she was on Years of Living Dangerously with Jack Black. That was kind of a neat moment, and I just love the the image. Like as you described, she would go during these events. Sometimes she'd be like jumping fences and going, you know, in private property to do these measurements, and sometimes she would drag her kids along. So, yeah, that is, Karen's pretty cool. She's she's a remarkable person. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a, a top. Question for you, Doug. And Tim, if you want to jump into it, because we, we got lots of honorable mentions from Sean, but I haven't heard Tim's yet. Um, what do you think was the not worst episode, but the most difficult to record? What was the toughest one? The one that you really had to prepare for, or like it was uh, challenging on an academic level? What was the one that was hardest? Okay. Tim, jump in after me. I got three that I'll do very quickly just for different reasons. My very first high-profile guest, besides Sean, um, <laughs> was Michael Mann. became high-profile after right. the interview. Right. Was, was Michael Mann this year? No, no. He was early on. He was like November, December of 2016. Of and year, okay. um, famous climatologist, hockey stick scientist, and I was so nervous. I was just a nervous wreck. And, you know, when you're dealing with audio, people don't realize you use Skype to record. And I'm just like, ah, and then... The moment when he came on, you know, he's like, oh, the microphone on my headphones don't work. And so he's just going to have to use the mic from the laptop, which is a, you know, podcaster. You want best audio quality. And it was going to just affect the quality. And I'm just like, oh, shit. So I was very nervous about that. But it turned out fine. You, most people don't even notice those things. And then, you know, um, I, I want to share with Catherine Mock, Dr. Catherine Mock from Stanford. She was the behind the scenes at the IPCC really accomplished uh, scientists led the writing of the chapter, the adaptation chapter. And we had been in touch and we were on the phone and I talked about like, you know, I, I try to have a, you know, a conversation and have a little bit of fun with this podcast. And she got it. She's like, I'm totally with this, but she's very formal scientist. And so we started the podcast. And so I'm introducing her and I'm saying a few things and I'm giving her pedigree, you know, Stanford, Harvard, whatever, just this, this just gold class pedigree. And I'm like, I was making fun of her, her resume. And I'm just like, oh, but do you, when you share your resume, do you put things on like, you know, I like Frisbee and stuff like that. And I was trying to make light of this ridiculously accomplished. And then there was like this 10 second pause, just nothing. And I'm like, oh, shoot, she's just not going with this humor. And then she's like, can we start over? You know, I wasn't expecting that. And uh, so we had to start the entire thing over. And she was totally game for me to bring some humor into it. It's just at that moment, she couldn't adjust to the humor of the situation. And I mean, we ended up having, I think, a very fun conversation. I mean, not that funny, but I appreciated her her willingness. But there was a moment there when I'm like, is she going to hang up on me thinking, who's this boob asking me these silly questions? So that, that was kind of fun. <laughs> so do you advise your, your interviewees differently now? Anticipate humor? Uh, I don't necessarily say it that way. I, I let the previous guests kind of speak for themselves, but I just really try to highlight that, you know, I want to have a conversation that a lot of people would like to listen to. I'm not, I avoid being too wonky and I think they get it. You know, the, if people are the kind of behind the scenes is if I can, I try to have a conversation on the phone before I interview some people, you don't get that opportunity like Bill McKibben, which I feel was one of my worst interviews. I didn't get a chance to chat with him in advance. And, um, yeah, you just don't get that luxury with some of the high profile people. So, hmm. yeah. You recorded from Uganda. How was that? Was that a different experience from how you normally do it in DC? <laughs> well, yes. Uh, and <clears throat> yeah, so I went to the community based adaptation conference in Uganda thanks to a spot. And I can mention it. Yeah. Okay. World Wildlife Fund sponsored it. was a little unsure at the when we originally did it. And I went. Uh, care of Turkey. I went in Istanbul for a couple of days, but then I went to Uganda and, you know, um, I just had my iPhone and I had a really good mic that you can plug into your iPhone. And that's how I recorded with people. And I, the quality is really good. And I just wandered around you know, the hotel grounds talking from people literally all over the world. It was so cool. And even when I got off my airplane, I, I was in a 
bus at five in the morning interviewing these two women from Malawi. You know, it was just an exciting thing to think that all these people were out there doing these these efforts. And you know, Sean, he's been encouraging me to get a taste of more international things, and he's been pushing me that this whole America adapts, very domestic oriented. Have to, adapts. Might have to yeah. change it to Earth adapts or something. Um, so no, it, it was, and I didn't get to go. I mean, mountain gorillas and all this cool wildlife, but I just didn't have time and the resources to actually go explore. But I did hang around the hotel a lot. But I did spend a couple of days in Turkey on the way over and got stopped by riot police during a political rally. So that was like my excitement for the trip. So that's right. I love the way you say that so casually, though. <laughs> <laughs> stopped by riot police. Oh, uh, I was taking photos of these was, like riot an police. There's insurrection going on. And, and one of the riot police came over to me and tapped me on the shoulder. And it's like, so I'm show me your phone and the photos. And I had to go, what, like, go through the photos and show them. And I took pictures of the police because it was this like peaceful political rally, and it broke up, and they were there. And he made me delete these photos in front of him, and I'm surrounded by these other police with like giant police shields, and so I deleted them. And then, like, 100 yards down the street after they let me go, I went to the recover delete file and got them all back. And they were quickly up on Facebook in, within a few moments. So You'll never go back to <laughs> did Screw I, you, did, you, dictator Turkey. Did, did I not send you a link to Midnight <laughs> Express? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Don't mess with Turkish police. All right. All right. Oh, yeah, okay. There you all go. Right. There's a story. So, um... Yeah. Other than more wine power, Alice, uh, well... <laughs> What were your thoughts of 2017? Are you trying to Tim? Yeah, Tim. Yeah. Oh, me? Oh. Yeah, Tim. Right, no. Do you have I, what, other honorable mentions or honorable so, second favorite? Can we say second favorite? Right, right, right. So, well, so I've mentioned two episodes already, but Sean um, conveniently printed out a list of all the speakers to jog my memory. Um, one of the things that I really like about this uh, whole podcast um, is that it works across the divide, whether it's real or perceived, of, you know, people on opposite sides of a climate change debate around the issue. And, um, you, you know, you, you talk to somebody who you think would be on the other side, and it turns out that they actually hold a lot of values and concerns and perspectives that you have on your side. And the guy from Oklahoma, the CNN, John Sutter, right? I thought that was a really um, interesting. Con- so he was, um, what he was, he was in Oklahoma for like, what fifteen years or something, reporting on energy and environment for uh, like one of the, the lead network stations. I thought it was the, the newspaper, oh, like the newspaper, Oklahoma, right, Oklahoma or something Oklahoma. like that. Right. So Oklahoma oil. Oil, 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 everything's oil. But on the other hand, it also has like this huge wind energy uh, development. And actually, they have some of the biggest wind energy developments in the country, uh, along with Texas. Anyway, so uh, he had some really interesting perspectives, I thought, and stories from the field about people, um, you know, who he had to relate to on a community level. But once he did that, found that sort of common ground or about concern around the environment or concern about ways of life um, that that climate change might bring an end to that and so was able to discuss people's concerns and how they were responding to climate change and so I would just sort of call that one out as a as another episode that I liked a lot awesome well that's a nice segue into what's coming up next for the podcast so, so recently you uh, turned America adapt into an NGO. You're, you're a, a registered 501c3, but that's going to open up some possibilities in 2018. So give us a bit of a history of the podcast. What? Why did you decide to start America Adapt, and then lead us to where we are now? All right, I won't I won't go too much into, like deep history, but so I started this podcast uh, in between in jobs. I uh, recently left a position, and I thought, okay, I'm going to keep my mind sharp on adaptation. So I started the podcast, and I just know a lot of people in the field. And I had planned to start this podcast when I was at that previous organization, and so I had the pieces in place, and I just said, you know what, I'm going to do this as I start looking for other things, and uh, it. I was producing it every week, you know, it was pretty regimented. And after a couple months, I was starting to get a small listener base and it was growing and people would recommend guests and it was sort of this organic thing. And then things like, you know, people would reach out to me, which was always really cool. And so like Sean, you know, you reach 
out to me because Nikhil, one of his employees, Nikhil Advani, was one of my first guests. But Sean started listening to it, and that's really cool. And then, like, Jesse Keenan from Harvard contacted me and said he was a listener. And so it was just kind of growing, and then I was getting some high-profile guests. And I was getting feedback that, oh, you're not so bad at this. You know, you you can ha- hold a decent interview. And I was getting excited, as a, and I thought, I could keep doing this. If I can find some sort of model where I could sustain it, and this is, you know, what I need to be doing full time, what are my pathways there? And so unless you're like a gigantic podcast, like what are the big ones, you know, like Pod Save America and those big guys, those are pro cast. I'm a narrow cast. So there's the big guys and the little guys. And so I was a little guy and the pathway for me was becoming a nonprofit organization. So I dug into that and um, found a fiscal sponsor with a social good fund. And so the goal was like to get charitable donations and sponsorships and hopefully eventually maybe even a foundation decides what I'm doing is worthy of funding. And so that happened last spring. All the while, I'm just getting more guests and I'm getting these paid sponsorships and people are having faith in what I do and the feedback that I was doing. And so um, I'm doing it full time now. And some, you know, I have people who are recurring donators, which I greatly appreciate, but then the sort of big sources of funding are sponsored podcasts. And I'm still figuring out that sustainable model, but I think there is the demand for that. And I'm just curious of this, the group here, you guys are my advisory committee. I think, and I think J- Jesse Keenan said it very well, it's just creating a platform that's kind of threading together this whole field of adaptation. And I'm, I'm there to talk to a lot of folks and it really is this wonky subject that most people get really bored with quickly. And a podcast is this unique way to communicate substantive information. And so, um, 2018 looks pretty exciting f- for me. Um, but I'm still it, listeners out there, as I always say in my intro for the price of a cup of coffee, recurring donation. Um, but yeah, I, that's a little bit of the history. And I, I just want to point out, I'm, succeeding in the form that I am right now because people want me to succeed and have been very helpful. You guys all in the advisory committee, Randy Olson has been a giant supporter of what I do. You know, all of the people out there that want me to succeed, it's been a, you know, it takes a village literally. And I, and I, you guys don't get to hear about those people, but you know, there's been a lot of people stepping up to help me with technology and with all the things that you guys don't hear about. So it's been a fun ride so far. Thanks to all of the supporters of America Adapts. Here, here, and a glass of wine to you. That's right. But Four may hours. it not be an avocado <laughs> wine. <laughs> <laughs> I recommend something made from grapes. <laughs> now, Sean and Tim, you're both members of Doug's or the America Adapts Advisory Council. What do you want to see more of in 2018? So pour the last dregs of the avocado wine. That was Sean taking well, the last bit of the wine. Well, this this I, is starting to grade into like particular guests we might want, perhaps. But um, but I think part of so, this too is just you know not just guests, but like what are we trying to accomplish? I mean, yeah. I'm saying we, you are on the advisory yeah, committee, yeah, no. the supporters. What's happening with adaptation? What should I, what role should America Adapts play in that? Yeah. You know. Well, for I'm really happy. First of all, I'm really proud to be associated with the podcast and America Adapts Media. It's uh, I consider it a professional growth for myself. So, and I'm also very happy that you chose the nonprofit route rather than I'm going to become a millionaire for myself <laughs> on podcasting. It is a, a, a service that you're providing for the good of communities and the earth, and I think that's a, a great way to do it by becoming a nonprofit. Um, you hinted at it before. Um, there is this whole world of adaptation happening outside of the United States. And uh, that what we here in the U.S. can learn from. And I hope that you continue to explore opportunities to do things from places that most Americans haven't even heard of. Um, and I will help support that whatever way I can. I have some more ideas, and, too. But yeah. Here. Well, just as a little bit of a counterpoint to that, I like the focus on the United States. And the reason is that I think... <laughs> <laughs> Sean's putting his thumb down. Right. Was that a thumb or something? It was a, it was it was a not different a finger. It was a different finger, yes. Um, <laughs> but um, the reason is, you know, our country is so uh, deeply polarized to the point where we can't even have conversations anymore. And 
Um, climate change is a polarized and polarizing topic in general. But when you start looking at adaptation and when you look at the people you've interviewed and you look at the substance of their comments, and I've hit this theme a couple times in this conversation, um, by definition, you're really succeeding in working across the divide. And I, I think that this podcast is, you know, it's not going to fix the world. It's not going to fix the United States. But it's, it's a nice example of a kind of conversation that can, um, uh, that can find and start from and build on the common ground that people across political divides, across ideological spectra, across class, across gender, across race, across you know, different sectors of the economy um, can have these meaningful conversations about what's important to them. And so for 2018, you know, as you grow, and especially as sort of this nonprofit, um, you know, it, it, it's not just kind of a, it's not just a podcast, but it's really maybe uh, an organization that can foster meaningful conversation among people who otherwise would not talk to each other. Doug, is that something that you are planning to focus on more? I mean, you've really, maybe by accident, included a lot of controversial voices in 2017. Do you see America Adapts as a place for these voices to kind of come together and discuss this issue? Or do you want to change focus and just listen to scientists in 2018? No, I, I've got a taste for like the non-traditional guest. And it doesn't even have to be like a, a denier or skeptic, but I mean, if that's what it is, great. It's just, I've discovered, you know, I'm almost like the force gump of interviewers. Like I kind of wade into these things accidentally and I can have these substantive conversations and just be naive to who sort of these people are and it works and I love it. And the response to it has been very positive and just quickly I had someone who found my podcast randomly and he told me he was a climate denier. And I've shared this before, but I don't think I've shared it within the podcast. And he reached out to me and he said he found it and he loved the logic of a lot of the guests. And so he did his own homework and he actually, we talked on the phone for a bit and we talked about why he, why he was a denier and such. And I don't know if he's gone back to being a denier, but he said he transitioned from being a denier to just being a bit of a skeptic. You know, he wasn't full on sort of saying this is climate change, but he liked the approach of talking about, you know, we're not even talking about the science of climate change anymore. It's like, well, how are we adapting to it? And just, it felt good to him. It felt, I think, just logical to him. And I was very excited about that because I didn't think your average skeptic might, you know, get any value out of the podcast. And if I, if I can get people just more comfortable saying, let's not get into changing the light bulbs. Let's talk about how we're going to adapt to sea level rise. And if that is a back alley way to get them to deal with the carbon emission issue, then awesome. I, I think there's a huge opportunity for, and I was not a big podcast listener. Sean, I think is the most experienced podcast listener here, but they really are these unique things. Like in this woman I just met with from Australia, she's a graduate student there. She's a big podcast listener. How she describes what a podcast is for her. Like, it's almost like better than a, a course, like a graduate student course. You can get this real substance, but the delivery system is, you know, it's so much better. But, it, you know, it's good to have people who you wouldn't normally agree with and have sort of provocative folks online. But, um, I, you know, I, I don't think it's helpful to have conversations with people just to be provocative because that then leads to people just shouting at each other. Right. And, and actually amping things up and reinforcing the divide. Whereas if you bring people together who really are polar opposites or something, but they, over the course of the conversation, come to agreement on some issue, that's exciting. And that's in this media environment, sadly, totally novel. Um, you know, and if we can have Sean Martin say, you know, I, I actually learned something valuable from um, from Mark Morano. Um that's that's a powerful thing that you offer, as Sean said. You know, this sort of the service you're providing to the to the world. And I... Well, Tim said the word exciting. Is there anything exciting that we can look forward to in 2018 that you're allowed to tell us about that? Oh boy, uh, I'm gonna lay hold off on. There's a couple really big things brewing, but I don't really want to jump the gun on those right now. So. 
In January, I think I'll be able to talk about one a bit more. Oh, God, this is not useful. This so is tune in then, folks. Tune in. <laughs> stick around. Uh, no, um, so a really big deal, and it, it rhymes, and I'll just say it rhymes with Smalifornia. Um, <laughs> that is in the works. And then potentially something really cool next summer that I'm going to be talking with some people this week about. Um, I think Doug's going to California. <laughs> and it rhymes with uh, Smouth Snafrica. California. Uh, California. What um, rhymes with Smalifornia? Yeah. You know, Tim, you just made a point and I wanted to follow up and I, I lost track of that thought. Oh, well. Um, People I, shouting at each other. Remind us how we can support America Adapts. If anyone is interested in things that rhyme with California and wants to see more of them, how can they financially contribute? <laughs> oh, wow. Great <laughs> question. <laughs> Donate um, shares of Bitcoin. You know, and these are the I get these from listeners who who who, do, who donate. They'll be like, "I've been meaning to do this," and I try to make it as easy as possible. And so you go to there's a Flip Cause donate page on all the show notes, and you can go there and you can do one time donations or you can do recurring donations. And so when you download the episode, if you look at the show notes, there should be all sorts of links to get there. And you know, it it. It's so hard for me to like fundraise. It's not my, you know, Sean and I talk about this a bit. It's like, oh, would you please consider donating? It's not my natural thing. Other Just people donate, do. people. He's, <laughs> he's, he's being shy again. We don't want to turn this into interrupted podcast every 20 minutes with hairy razors and blue apron and Casper mattresses. <laughs> You're doing everyone a service by supporting the podcast financially, and Doug is doing a great job, and we want to see a lot more of that happen in 2018 and beyond. Absolutely. And speaking of 2018, it's time for Speed Round. What would everyone like to, or would everyone please suggest a future guest? Just one? Not with him. Okay, Trey Crowder, Red State Update. Oh, do you have a connection? No, of course not. <laughs> All right. I watch him on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, we're taking notes here. All right. Folks out there, I'm sure know who he is. I've never heard of him. Um, Sean, do you have a name? Yes. Um, I am going to recommend the mayor of my hometown, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Bill Peduto, who uh, became somewhat of a name when somebody mentioned this, we're Pittsburgh, not Paris, comment, and he said, we voted for Hillary, not you. And since right. then, he's been a big climate voice. He's a great guy. Um, and Pittsburgh is doing a lot of great things to make them more resilient to climate impacts. Uh, floods are a big problem there. They're one of the uh, Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities program. And Mayor Peduto and I were born 24 hours apart. So there's something cosmic going on wow. there that... Make it happen. After really awesome. Make it happen. Make it happen. All right. Doug, who do you want that you've never been able to see into? I think I'm getting to that sweet spot maybe in six months that I think it's per perfectly reasonable to think President... Oh, we've got some people outside here. It's all right. Sean's about to go kick some butt. Um, uh, I would like to get President Obama on, and he actually is, you know... Big climate person, and I think you know. After six more months of doing this, it's not out of the question. And he was such a leader on climate change, and especially adaptation. That would be fabulous, you know. Especially out of office, maybe he could let his hair down a little bit and talk about these things. So that that I mean, that's the gold standard. There's so many other people that you know would be great. James Cameron, Jerry Brown, all those sort of people. And I can't keep up. Like I've, <laughs> you know, I have these, you know, feast or famine, but rice. Right now, it's feast of like climate change episodes. I've got Zillow coming up, and I've got so you know, it's just mm -hmm. it, it's. I have these all these great conversations. So no, you stole my my person. I know we're wrapping up, and I'm about to hand over the hosting reins back to you. But the one person I'm putting in a personal request for is James Cameron, not just because I love Terminator, but because I want to ask him why he decided to move himself to New Zealand. If he's he's a uh, Big climate guy, and he's doing a lot of advocacy work for the planet, but he is also entrenched himself in a compound in New Zealand. I want to know the, the true story of why he did it. 
and yeah. also how we can survive the zombie apocalypse. I would, I would be dream. I've been a big James Cameron friend for decades, but I, I would get off on these tangents of like, why are you wasting your time on these Avatar movies? Let's go back to Aliens mm-hmm. and Terminator. So mm-hmm. yeah, it might not be a good fit. I could just get sidetracked. So fifty percent America adapt, fifty percent. Oh my God, Terminator. Okay. <laughs> so speaking of, all right, Doug, wait, wait, Tim, Tim's, Tim's wait, hold on. Tim's was saying something. What? Speaking so, of smell of Fornia, um. Any chance do you think of, of interviewing the governor or the former governator? I can't speak to that right now. I'm winking at Tim right now, but I'm I just I don't want to talk about that right now just yet. So wow. um, Jade, I think you've gotta probably go soon. So I know you're trying to hand it off and let's wrap this up, right? My producer is here uh, telling me well, you gotta get this way, stop talking. So you know what? If it's oh, if it's better for you, I mean, I can wrap this up. Um, you know what? Let's just wrap it up right now, guys. We did. This was a lot of fun. We drank wine. Jade, you did a wonderful job hosting. I think you need to be a guest host. You were so awesome, and I love that Aussie accent. I'm very excited about getting this episode out. It was our holiday special, and um, yeah, uh, thanks again, guys. So, Sean, happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Have a great New Year. Happy New Year. Here's to 2018. May it be better than the last. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Okay, Adapters, that is a wrap to the holiday special. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Thanks to Sean, Jade, and Tim. I will have some links to some of the work they are doing. So I waited until the end to mention this, but I wanted to apologize for the audio quality. It was my first time doing this sort of panel discussion with someone else in a different location and multiple people in another location. And I'm also testing out some new audio equipment equipment. So I want to get that out. Well, I want to get this podcast out before the end of the year. I just wanted to note that if you did notice that. Okay. So final housekeeping, don't forget to join the Facebook page and the Facebook community group. The group is private, but just search for America Daps and ask to join and I will approve you right away. It's a chance to hear insider info on the podcast and see what other listeners are sharing on that Facebook wall. We've had some really cool dialogues coming out of that group. And again, I love hearing from you. I mean it. Just say hi. If you have an idea for a guest, let me know. It's the highlight of my week, and it sometimes leads to cool things like me meeting Bernadette in person and having a wonderful chat. I'm at americadaps at gmail.com. Send me an email. Okay, check out the website at americadaps.org. All this information is in my show notes, especially the link to that donate page. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time. And this is probably the final episode of the year. And I hope you all have a great new year. This is America Daps.